We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as we are moving through 1 Corinthians. We're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday. So that means verse 14, moving on through chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, if you'd follow along. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For the, we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and, and all is fullness. If any of you who, uh, do, if any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all his fullness. Conscious, I say, not your own, but that of a, the, another. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Now, this wraps up this section that started back in chapter 8, and we've been preaching on chapters 8, 9, and 10 about disputable matters, about Christian freedom. This is a very important topic, and Paul gives a lot of time in this letter to this issue. Now, you and I don't have to worry about meat offered to idols. Your wife may have given you some burnt offerings from time to time, but not in a religious sense. Or maybe you've given her some burnt offerings off the grill from time to time. Now, we don't have to be worried about that. But this was a real issue, as we've seen in Corinth. But it is the principles around this that you and I can apply. This is an incredibly important issue in the Christian life. How do I deal with things the Bible does not say yes or the Bible does not say no? How do I deal with these disputable things? How far can I take my Christian liberty that I have in Jesus Christ? And this is something that we're going to struggle with and have to deal with for our whole life. And it's something that different Christians are going to see their liberty in certain situations differently that I do or that you do. So it's a vital area, and that's why Paul spends so much time on it. Now, again, the issue at Corinth was meat offered to idols in the pagan temples. The problem was some of the Corinthians were misusing their liberty. And I uh, preached last week on these early verses in chapter 10 and a very strong warning from the Apostle Paul. And he gives another warning here as we're going to see. In verses 1 through 13, he used the Exodus generation as the example. This final section is sort of in, you can divide this into two halves. Verses 14 to 22, Paul presents what I would call a non-negotiable explicit matter. And that is participating in the pagan temple worship. Some of the Corinthians were actually going back to the pagan temples, not only going back into them, but participating in many of their immoral things. Verses 23 to 33, he's going to go back and finalize the issue on the disputable, questionable things, particularly as it centers around the issues of eating meat offered to idols, but something we can gain principles from 
to apply to our lives. Now, it's important that we remind ourselves of a very important reality. It is not that you as a congregation are under the scriptures proclaimed by a man. Rather, the man and the congregation are under the scriptures proclaimed by God. If you come here and it's not, we're not preaching our ideas, we're not preaching our philosophy, we who preach the word of God, like the congregation, we are under the word of God, which is proclaimed by God, not proclaimed by man. So anytime you come to a passage of scripture, you need to be reminded, I need to be reminded, this is the word of God. This is inspired, infallible scripture. Now let's look at the first issue, participating in pagan temple worship. Verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. Paul loved these people. He spent a year and a half with them. And notice how tender in this very critical issue. Now he's just in the first 13 verses given them a strong warning about apostasy. Now Paul is dealing with idolatry and he says to them, he appeals to them as brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, I believe that you are wise enough to discern for yourself the things that I'm going to remind you of. That's why he uses a number of rhetorical questions. Paul is a master communicator. And like the Lord Jesus, who often used convicting questions, Paul uses a number of rhetorical questions in here. But then you'll notice when he wants to talk about something explicit, he doesn't use a question. Idolatry is never to be flirted with. You realize the first two of the Ten Commandments deal with idolatry. To worship someone or something other than the true God is forbidden. 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Even worshiping the true God in the wrong way can be a form of idolatry. Now, what Paul does is he's going to use the illustration of communion, and then he's going to use the illustration of Israel in the Old Testament when they made their sacrifices. Look at this first of all. When believers observe communion, they are in communion with Christ and other believers. The word communion is koinonia, which means fellowship, partnership, sharing in common. Verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Now, Pastor Lou, in a couple of weeks, will talk more about the communion service. This is why often when Pastor Brian does the communion service, one of the things he often tells us is not only to look to the cross, but to look around. That's why I personally don't believe in personal communion. I believe communion is to be done in, with the body of Christ. That's what it's illustrating. Many believe the cup of blessing was the third cup in the Passover meal. And many believe it was that third cup that the Lord Jesus in the last Passover, when he transitioned to the first communion service, it was the cup of blessing which he used. It became a symbol of his shed blood on the cross. The one bread represents his body, which was given for all of us, but it also represents the body of Christ because when we are born again, the Holy Spirit indwells us and he baptizes us, places us into Christ, places us into the body of Christ. That's what makes Christian fellowship so dynamic. That's why the church is the most unique entity on the face of planet earth because we are believers, we have the Holy Spirit, we come together and in yes, a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. Communion is a spiritual experience. I'm not saying it's some kind of weird kind of thing, but when you come with the right heart attitude and you come with understanding what the elements represent, the elements that Jesus Christ himself uh, said and verified, this is what you will use, the cup and the bread. Now in this modern age and because of COVID, we use that individual cup with the wafer on top. We chose that because the wafer is so delicious and the grape juice is so delicious. No, that, that's not true. 
But the point is, the bread and the cup in whatever form are the elements that Jesus Christ himself instituted. We're to remember him. We're to remember him in his sacrifice, in his death, burial, and resurrection. So in communion, we're fellowshipping with Christ, and we're fellowshipping with the body of Christ, other believers. Now he goes back to the Old Testament, and he says even Old Testament worshipers experienced mutual fellowship as they worshiped at the altar. Look at verse 18. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Interesting. The word partakers is that word again, koinonia, communion, partnership, fellowship, you know, oneness. So even in the Old Testament, you have this principle of communing with God and communing with one another. See, they would bring the sacrifice to the priest. Some of it would be burnt on the altar as a sacrifice to the Lord. Some of it would, would be given to the priest, you know, for their means. And then some of it would be taken home by the worshiper and eaten with himself or his family. So there was indeed a communion between God and the worshiper and one another. Paul's pointing out that everyone was involved with God, everyone was involved with each other, whether it is the communion service that by now the Corinthians would have been very familiar with, or whether it's the Old Testament sacrifices at the altar, it's the same principle. Now, why is Paul doing this? Because Paul now is going to transition into pagan worship, pagan temple worship, and the sacrifices in the pagan temple. Behind all idolatry is a real spiritual presence. Now, pay attention to what Paul says. This wasn't just true in the first century. This is true in the 21st century. Verse 19, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. What's he talking about? He's saying to them, look, I realize that idols are simply man-made pieces of wood and pieces of stone. And I recognize that the idol isn't anything at all. However... Behind the unreality of idols is the reality of demons. And I would submit to you that behind all idolatrous worship is demons. New Testament talks about the doctrine of demons. Any church or any religious group or whatever that's preaching anything apart from the word of God that is either adding to the gospel or taking from the gospel... That's inspired by Satan and his demons. Satan is real. Demons are fallen angels. And they can exercise a certain amount of power as God permits them. Ephesians 6.12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, we don't have to fear Satan and his demons. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And so I don't walk around at night or in the dark or wherever thinking a demon's going to jump out at me, you know. Um, But you can open yourself up to demonic influence. I don't believe a Christian can be demon-possessed, but I certainly believe you can be demon-oppressed. And that would happen when you open yourself up to something demonic. Listen, just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean there's not a spiritual power behind it. Just because you don't believe in something, it doesn't mean there's not a spiritual power behind it. Many of these occultic things and reading your palms and you know, tarot cards and Ouija boards and, and you know, people that uh, proclaim to, you know, speak to the dead. A lot of that is faked, but behind much of that is force, a real spiritual force. I won't permit any of that stuff to be in my home 
And now with this new age and with uh, television and the internet and have you noticed there's so much coming out that involves something demonic, something spiritual. And if I see that, I just turn it off. I don't want that influence. I don't even want that beaming into my home. And Christians, you would be wise to stay away from all of that. And I believe as we move to the end of the age, Satan's activity, we know from Scripture, is going to become more and more. And so who knows what manifestations of the demonic we're going to see as our culture continually drifts into paganism. Many occult and pagan claims are faked, but there can also be a force behind them. James chapter 4, verse 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In other words, you don't rebuke the devil. Michael the archangel wouldn't even rebuke the devil over the body of Moses, so you certainly can't. You just resist the devil. Remember what we talked about last week. No temptation, trial, test. God's going to permit that to overcome you. You just resist temptation. You walk away from it. You resist the devil. And the Bible says he will flee from you. Credible promise. So what is Paul saying here? The worship of Christ and idolatry are mutually exclusive. So what I mean by in these verses, Paul's going to talk about some non-negotiables. Notice verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. He's not asking a question here. He's stating a fact. You can't be involved in demonic things and then come to the communion table and truly worship the Lord. They're mutually exclusive. You cannot do that. Any worship other than the true worship of Jesus Christ is idolatry and it is offensive to Almighty God. Verse 22, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So Paul is condemning the Corinthians who were going back to the pagan temple and getting involved in the worship. Maybe they weren't even getting involved in some of the immorality, but they were in there while they're making these sacrifices saying, well, I know an idol's not anything, but Paul is saying, whoa, wait a minute. There's a real spiritual force behind that. Church, be careful. Be very careful. Young people, in this present age, be careful. There's so much of satanic activity out there. Don't be an unwitting victim of Satan. He is real. No matter what the world laughs at, he is real. He's made himself a caricature. The best thing he can do is have people not believe in him. But he is real. And he has a great amount of power, but you don't have to fear him. You don't give him an open door. And you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Now, in the last part, Paul is summing up this whole issue of disputable things. So he goes back to eating meat offered to an idol. Verse 23, all things are lawful for me. Now, we've seen this before. Um, Some believe this was uh, something the Corinthians quoted a lot. We know that Corinthian culture was so debauched, kind of anything goes... Others believe that Paul maybe taught this when he was teaching on spiritual liberty. But either way, what was happening was that the Corinthians, some of them, were using this for blanket permission. I can do anything I want with anyone I want at any time I want. Sounds like our culture, doesn't it? Paul was definitely on the side of spiritual freedom. I mean, Paul was a champion of spiritual freedom. There was a group called the Judaizers going around trying to trap everybody in, in the laws of Moses and being circumcised, and Paul defended that. Galatians 5.1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He didn't want them to get tied up in unnecessary restrictions. You know, don't easily surrender your spiritual liberty. You know, some churches are known more for legalism than they are for liberty. Those churches are usually devoid of joy, you know. They have an answer for every question, but no one's allowed to question. And so we believe in liberty. That doesn't mean that anything goes. 
just because another believer is offended by something you allow in your life doesn't mean that you should restrict your liberty. It depends on if it's a weaker brother, if it's someone who's an immature Christian who is going to be offended or hurt by something that you or I allow in our lives. But there are many things in this culture in Christian life that we could talk about to apply. So what kind of things are you talking about, Pastor? Um, use of alcohol, tobacco, you know. It used to be going to movies, but now the movies come into your home. Um, dancing for some Christians. Um, if you ever saw me dance, you would be offended. That's why I don't dance, because I can't dance, okay? And so these are, you know, these were the issues. We used to call them the filthy five, you know, the things that, you know, growing up and certain things. And some of them, it's good to be cautious, but some Christians allow some things. Other Christians don't allow them. We allow for differences. That's why I wanted um, Romans, Ken to read Romans chapter 14. The whole chapter deals with these issues. We saw earlier that we need to understand how to exercise our freedom in brotherly love. So what Paul does now is, in summary, he gives some summary principles. He says, and we can apply these today as they applied them then. Number one, edification versus gratification. Notice verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Of course, he's not talking about the things that the scripture forbids when he says that. So he's probably applying a cultural thing, but he's, make, he, he's qualifying it. And he's saying not all things edify. They don't build up. The main things are plain, as Alistair Begg says. The ins are in, the outs are out. And some things in Scripture are very clear. But again, we're talking about things that aren't specifically mentioned in the Bible. So are these going to build me up? Are they going to build others up? Or are they not? Is my concern more for my personal pleasure or am I more concerned about pleasing the Lord? Do I even stop to ask these questions? Or do I just sort of live my life for myself, not caring how it impacts other believers? Can I do this in full assurance? You know, I've seen other Christians do something and I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe it'd be okay for me to do that. Remember what Ken read, Romans 14, 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith or whatever is not from faith is sin. And you could put something in there other than for what he eats, something that you are struggling with, whether you should do it or not, in the culture today. Second principle, others versus myself. Now, we've seen this before, so it must be pretty important. Verse 24, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Can I honestly say that the exercise of my spiritual liberty first takes into account another's well-being? Can I honestly say that? Do I even stop to think about that? How this might impact other people? Whatever your position is, whatever your influence is, whether you're a parent with children, you know, uh, whatever it is, maybe it's it, here it's in the church and you're, you're ministering to kids and, and young people. I mean, do, you even take, do I even take that into account? Do I live by Philippians 2? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, here's a question, a convicting question, at least for me. What have I given up or what am I giving up for the sake of others? This takes it out of principle into the real world. What have I given up? What am I giving up intentionally for the sake of others? It's the way Paul lived. Romans 14, 21, it is good neither to eat meat or drink wine or anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Now, again, you got to figure out who the weaker brother is. There's something called the tyranny of the weaker brother. Some mature Christian doesn't like something that you allow. That's not what he's talking about here. Next principle, liberty versus legalism. Liberty versus le legalism is living by a set of rules, you know. Um, I remember Sally and I one time had circumstances. We, we ended up visiting a, a Christian school and they had this huge thing on the wall. It was a list of rules you got demerits for, you know. And some of them were pretty petty. 
Um, and I thought, man, so that's your first impression when you walk in here, is all this stuff you can't, you can't and I, I realize you've got to have rules and parameters. I understand that. Legalism versus liberty. Verse 25, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Oh, no, whoa, 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 stop, Paul. You're giving me a headache. Isn't this contradicting everything you just said? Well, now, wait a minute. What's his point? His point is that once the meat leaves the temple, it's just meat. This goes back to the deal that he knows an idol isn't anything, but he realizes there's a spirit, spirit behind the idol if you're participating in that service. But once the meat comes out of the temple and it goes in the marketplace, there's no demon inside the meat. There's nothing that happened to the meat. It's just meat. And so Paul is acknowledging that. He quotes from Psalm 24, 1. All foods provided by the Lord. 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. It is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And if you can eat in a good conscience, you haven't sinned. Hey, kids, you might try this. If your mom or dad wants to have you eat something that you don't like, in my mind, I'm thinking Brussels sprouts. Now, some of you love Brussels sprouts. I think they're good if they're covered in melted cheddar cheese. I think that's fantastic. Next time mom wants to give you something you don't like, like broccoli or that spinach, just tell her, you, you, you can't eat that for conscience sake, okay? <laughs> Let me know how that works for you. <laughs> if you could still talk after that, but I'm of course kidding. If we do at times limit our liberty, we should do so out of voluntary you know, it's our idea, voluntary restriction, not legalistic compulsion. Legalism never produces holy living, never. It creates bondage. Next principle, love versus liberty. Whoa, now wait a minute. This is the other side of the coin. If any of those, verse 27, who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you asking no question for conscience sake. Now, he's not talking about like today if you go to somebody's house and they put something in front of you and you're like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> no, no. This has to do with meat offered to an idol, okay? He's presenting a hypothetical situation. You've been invited to a pagan's home and so they put meat in front of you. Don't say, is this meat come out of the temple? You know, is this temple meat? Do you realize that many of the Christian liberty issues that the church fusses about, the world doesn't have a clue, and they could care less. It's just like us infighting in our little, little club. Verse 28, but if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you, and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all his fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. Now, presumably, this is another Christian, because if it isn't, it makes no sense whatsoever. So, presumably, his hypothetical situation is, he's trying to put these principles in some kind of realistic format so the Corinthians can apply them. So, you, in the home of an unbeliever, they offer you meat, don't ask questions, just eat it. But if there's another Christian there, and in this case would be a weaker Christian, and they say to you, do you know, this meat was offered to an idol. That means they have an issue with it. They can't eat it in good conscience. So Paul says, you, you, instead of insisting your freedom in that situation, and don't get in an argument with the believer in front of the non-Christian, because of love, you just defer, not your conscience, but for his conscience. And in that case, don't eat it. Paul says, you're better off to offend your host who's an unbeliever than to damage the conscience of a weak brother. Verse 29 and 30, he anticipates the objections the Corinthians are going to give him. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? I think a better translation is if I partake by grace. Now, what, what, why, do I, why do I have to do this? 
Paul was echoing the arguments they would certainly use. They wanted to assert their rights in every situation. They didn't want to consider the other weaker brother. Paul was a strong Christian, but at the same time, he was very sensitive to weaker Christians that were around him. And then he gives us verse 31. Verse 31 is the ultimate summation of this whole issue. Verse 31 is one of the most important principles for a believer's life you will find in the Bible. It's really underlines everything we've said in chapters 8, 9, and 10 can boil down to this verse. So I know what you're thinking. Well, then why did you go through chapters 8, 9, and 10? Why didn't you just jump ahead to this verse? Well, notice what he says. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God of God. What should underline my life? What should be involved in every decision I make? The glory of God. Will this reflect the attributes of my God? Will will, will this, uh, this is ascribed glory. God has intrinsic glory, but this is ascribed glory. This is what we're going to be doing. Uh, We're going to praise him for who he is and what he has done and his attributes. And, and, And the idea is our Christian life is to reflect that to other people. Whatever I do, do all to the glory of God. The ultimate purpose of using my Christian liberty selflessly is to glorify God. We glorify God by thinking and acting in ways that reflect his character to the world. We glorify God when we exalt his name and praise him. We've, we've, we've ascribed glory to God in this service as we prayed and as we've given and as, as we fellowship and as we've worshiped and sung and as we all, including myself, sit under his word. Give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Another issue where the chapter division shouldn't be there. Paul is saying, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul is not a people pleaser. When he says, I please all men, he's not a people pleaser. He's not wishy-washy. He doesn't, he doesn't change things, you know, on a whim, depending on who he's with. He's a strong Christian, but he understands his, his, the fact that he, he's going to give an account to the Lord one day, Romans 14, we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and he understands there's things far more important in my life than eating and drinking or all these disputable things. The most important thing in my life is will I glorify God? Will I honor him? and glorify his Savior and follow Jesus' example. Because who was it that perfectly displayed love for God and for others? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. In his amazing condescension to come down and become a man, die on the cross for our sin. What an amazing condescension. So what's the big deal if I sense something in, in, in my liberty, you know, purview something that I would allow in my life, but I would not do that, or I would freely give it up, not out of compulsion, not out of legalism, but out of love. And I would do that because I feel this is the best way for me to glorify God. So if we haven't done anything else through these three chapters, I hope at least all of us will take a moment now and then when we're trying to decide in these different issues or take an interview of our Christian life and really see what what am I involved in that I can honestly do so with a good conscience. I can do it by faith. I honestly believe this is not going to impact a weaker Christian. But again, there will be times when maybe I'm involved with someone and I have to even forgo my liberty a little bit more because... I want to encourage them. I want to edify them. And I want to help them grow as a believer. These are difficult questions. Every Christian has to decide these issues for themselves. This is why in our church, we don't give you this big list of rules. You have to make those decisions for your family, for yourself. But whatever we do, we do it to glorify our Savior.